Welcome to the National Press Club, the world's leading professional organization for journalists. I'm Michael Friedman, the 113th president of the National Press Club. I am the former general manager of CBS Radio Network, now journalist in residence at University of Maryland Global Campus, and executive producer of the Kalb Report public broadcasting series moderated by journalist Marvin Kalb. We thank you for joining us today for our virtual headliner event with Gary Kasparov, who joins us from his summer home in Croatia. Mr. Kasparov, welcome to the National Press Club. We are pleased to accept questions from our audience, especially our journalists tuning in today. I'll ask as many as time permits. To submit a question, please email headliners at press.org. Politics is often described as the ultimate game of chess. The possible moves are vast, your opponent is sometimes unpredictable, and with one bad move, game over. Gary Kasparov was a chess prodigy who reached international grandmaster status as a teenager in 1980 and is among the finest chess players in history. He retired from competition in 2005 and turned his brilliant strategic mind to the high stakes game of politics. Mr. Kasparov emerged as an outspoken critic in the former Soviet Union's post-Glasnost period, using his international fame to call for more rapid and far-reaching democratic and market reforms. But for Mr. Kasparov, Vladimir Putin's ascendancy to the Russian presidency in 1999 marked a turning point. He called Putin a threat to freedom and democracy, marking himself as an enemy to the former KGB officer turned politician. Mr. Kasparov formalized his opposition in 2005 with the founding of the United Civil Front and Other Russia, a coalition of political parties with one goal, to push Mr. Putin from power. Vladimir Putin seems unlikely to budge. He has remained in power first as president, then as prime minister, and now again as president, and fully intends to remain there. To that end, he recently succeeded in passing amendments to the Russian Constitution that would allow him to remain in power until 2036. Mr. Kasparov, after struggling to live in Russia as a pro-democracy activist, moved in 2013 to New York City, where he found the Renew Democracy Initiative. He also chairs the New York-based Human Rights Foundation. He focuses his efforts on promoting and defending liberal democracy in the United States and abroad. Today we are very pleased to have him join us for a discussion on the state of human rights and press freedom in his native Russia and around the world and the world of politics. Gary Kasparov, thank you again for joining us. Let's get started. In a newsletter this week, the moderator of the CNN program, Reliable Sources, Brian Stelter, recalled the following quote from you. If you're a thief, accuse your enemies of thievery. If, correct, uh, if corrupt, accuse your rivals of corruption. If a coward, accuse others of cowardice. Evidence is irrelevant. The goal is to dilute the truth. How, in your estimation, does this quote apply to both Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin. It applies directly. Uh, it's more to Donald Trump because Vladimir Putin controls uh, media in Russia. He doesn't have to pretend that uh, he's something else but an all-powerful dictator. Uh, Donald Trump uh, uh, is the president of the United States and uh, he has to play uh, the game by certain rules. Not that he respects them very much, but he, you know, he has to at least pretend that he's following this, these rules. Um, and uh, um, that's what I saw in the U.S. politics uh, in the last few years. I uh, have been warning. Um, uh, I, I, I actually issued my first warnings about uh, uh, Donald Trump as early as in 2015, because I could see how uh, uh, the man with this ability to control news cycle um, was in the position to um, uh, eliminate truth uh, um, and honesty and even factor of honor from U.S. politics. Um, actually, uh, one of my most popular tweets was about the concept of modern propaganda. That's the point of modern propaganda is not to, to sell an agenda, but to annihilate the truth and to uh, exhaust critical thinking. 
And uh, that's, what bring, that's what brings Trump and Putin together, because they are not necessarily want to sell you an agenda. They don't want you to believe in something. They just want you not to believe in anything, because that gives them an opportunity to shift from one target to another. And, uh, and uh, that's, you know, um, creates an environment where people like them uh, could be very successful. Mr. Trump certainly appears to have an affinity for Mr. Putin. Um, their relationship to the general public appears somewhat murky. Uh, what can you tell us uh, from what you know about the relationship between Mr. Trump and, and Mr. Putin? I don't know more than you do. I, uh, I don't have any access to secret dossiers. Uh, I'm not privy to information that can uh, indict Mr. Trump uh, of having conflict of interest. I'm sure we'll learn more when we have access to his tax returns. All I can tell you is that uh, it's the, there's a psychology in the relations between Putin and Trump. And as uh, someone who grew up in the Soviet Union and met enough KGB officers in my life, uh, if I read Putin's body language when he spoke to Trump, um, it was a clear message uh, to me that uh, that was a conversation between a handler and an asset. That's the way Putin looked at Trump. That's the way Putin spoke to him. And that's the, uh, that's the way he, he wanted the rest of the world to see his total dominance. Not that Putin had much of respect for other foreign leaders. He always uh, speaks to them with some kind of con contempt. Uh, when he speaks to Merkel, to Macron, to British prime ministers. The difference, of course, is China. With Chinese dictator, he speaks differently. That's a different body language. He understands that uh, uh, all uh, his arrogance uh, should be set aside because he's talking to a much bigger fish, um, a big, much bigger predator. Um, but uh, the, there's a difference. The way Putin looks at Trump, speaks to him, and the way he treats other four leaders. And that's, uh, you know, if we combine all these um, consequential evidences to get together, so it tells me that there is something that Putin knows about Trump, and Trump knows that Putin knows it, that makes his relations uh, so much, so one-sided. And what do you see as the role of social media in the propaganda campaign that you've talked about? It certainly allows Donald Trump to bypass the traditional journalists and go right to his base. Um, social media definitely helps to promote uh, all sorts of uh, fake news. We discovered that uh, uh, with hundreds and thousands and uh, many thousands of, of channels that are being uh, um, used by social media uh, um, uh, tools, uh, you can easily sell whatever you want. Um, it's not about lying or telling the truth, is basically trying to have alternative reality. But most important thing, and that's what gave Trump a huge advantage in 2016, and now it's it's not, you know, as, as he's not as dominant as he used to be, but he was a great, a, a great expert in shifting the, uh, the conversation. He always knew how to control the news cycle. And uh, that's why he didn't care about being criticized for something about violating the traditional norms, because he knew next day there would be another scandal. And then, and, and then this new scandal will make people forget the previous scandals. So Trump was really good in just, you know, in moving around and creating more mess. And that's the way to cure the, uh, the, the, the problems that uh, people just, you know, they, they tend to forget. For instance, now uh, with Trump's, with Trump's uh, um, outrageous statements and, and his be outrageous behavior um, uh, when he got COVID, uh, there's very little uh, is being said about uh, his taxes. And, and that's the whole story of his four years presidency. So every time that you have, a, you have an issue that could, uh, could potentially could bring down any president before Trump, he always comes up with a new scandal. And, uh, and, it's, and this is ongoing cycle uh, that, uh, that doesn't uh, give people enough time to concentrate on the issues that typically in America, were devastating for any any president for any official. So a lot of diversionary tactics uh, along along the way here that would take your eye off the ball of uh, of of um, of the principal principal news. Um, you mentioned before about the way Donald Trump treats uh, other world leaders. Um, 
diplomacy seems uh, to have become more like uh, kickboxing uh, in, in recent years. Do you sense that traditional diplomacy as we have known it um, is morphing into something different or is, um, is diplomacy still an effective tool uh, for, for nations? Oh, diplomacy cannot be um, uh, pushed aside. It, people still, still negotiating. Uh, whether they do political deals or business deals, uh, um, it's both domestically and internationally, it's, it's still very important that uh, all lines of communications are open. But um, in, in, the era, in the era of Donald Trump, Diplomacy very often is being dominated by uh, by personal uh, uh, affections or um, 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 rejections, and uh, Donald Trump shows a great affinity to world dictators for a simple reason: he envies them. He wants to be as powerful uh, as un and uncontrolled as Xi Jinping or Putin on Kim Jong Il or Erdogan. That's why his behavior is so different. When he talks to dictators, um, though he still represents the, the most powerful country in the world, he somehow feels uncomfortable. So he's not subordinate, but he knows that these people can do something he, he, he wants to accomplish, but still cannot. And when he talks to the leaders of the free world, American traditional allies, his behavior is, is di diametrically opposite. He, is, he talks to them almost with contempt, uh, sometimes even insulting them because he feels that he's stronger. He knows that America is the most powerful leader of the, of the, of the free world and he can uh, ignore their opinion, not recognizing that uh, America's strengths was also uh, 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 due to its, its ability to build coalitions and uh, to lead uh, uh, other nations. And obviously the damage uh, caused by Donald Trump's presidency uh, will take years to, um, to cure. Uh, and uh, again, I just hope that uh, it will not be too late. So to people who believe that Donald Trump may still be an anomaly in the course of American history, um, your, your answer to that question that it, could take years to recover if, if we change course um, as a result of this election. Uh, does that make him not, not an anomaly? Is uh, his, his impact, are you saying, will be felt for many years to come? Um, yeah, I don't think that we should, we should treat Donald Trump as an anomaly because Trump is more like a symptom. The very fact that one of the two major parties nominated Donald Trump and country, though my minority, but let's, you know, let's not now uh, debate the Electoral College, and the country elected him as a president tells you that something was wrong. And Donald Trump exposed so many weaknesses of American political system, uh, so many uh, um, loopholes that he exploited quite skillfully um, because we just discovered that so much of American political system was based on, on the call of honor, on the traditions. You don't do this because nobody did it before because that's wrong. And Donald Trump's response, sue me, big deal. I just do it because it's technically, it's not illegal. And um, he pushed really far uh, in every direction. And I think what is important for us to understand that the accumulation of, of um, enormous executive power in the American presidency, that's, that was an ongoing process uh, um, from, from the late 70s. So when America recovered uh, from, from Watergate, uh, created a situation where we have to make sure that this enormous power will, will find its match in, in new regulations. It's not enough now to, to rely on the spirit of law. So we have to actually you know, put as many letters as we can because uh, Donald Trump demonstrated that uh, even he, the man not the most intelligent, corrupt, uh, 
um, not you know the, not um, uh, very you know, consistent uh, with with his message. Uh, that never had a proper ideology. You know, even he succeeded. Now imagine a Donald Trump, uh, younger, with a strong ideological beliefs, not corrupt. You know, very you know concentrated on on his or her goals, and uh, that could be a real danger unless we recognize that American political system needs uh, needs to be adjusted to the challenges of the 21st century. Uh, to the world where social media could uh, uh, um, influence every campaign, and uh, uh, the world is 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 global, uh, at, and at the same time very local because uh, every individual now could uh, could make a, quite a, quite quite an impact uh, on the race, uh, not only for local representatives but also for 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 the nationwide race. You mentioned that you effectively saw this coming as early as 2015 um, and started talking about it. Why do you think so many Americans, including the leadership of the Democratic Party, didn't see it coming? Look, uh, I think it's one of the problems that Democrats had to uh, resolve in 2016, 2015, 2016 political cycle they wanted to elect an unelectable woman. I think that's the, that was a big problem. Hillary Clinton was unelectable and uh, they, they, they thought that Donald Trump was a gift from heaven because I don't think she stood a chance against uh, a mainstream Republican. So that's why the, uh, the liberal media gave Trump uh, so much free time and also publicity with uh, almost no criticism. Uh, until the uh, the end of the of um, of the um, um, conventions, uh, the the end of summer 2016, Donald Trump ran his campaign and and his, his message almost unopposed, and uh, and that gave him tons of opportunities to establish his presence and to control the Republican Party, and and when Democrats eventually attacked him, yeah, it still probably could work if they had another candidate, but uh, Hillary Clinton proved to be a candidate that uh, uh, turned away many, many uh, voters who supported Obama without any second thought, but they, they, they either stayed home or shifted to Donald, to, to Donald Trump. Uh, and again, that's another problem of, of two-party system. So it's, the, it's, it's not about selling um, American public a, a new agenda or presenting the best candidate. It's all about having the uh, lesser evil. And um, I think the fact is that in 2016, two, two candidates from major parties had a combined negative rating of 120%. Tells you that uh, something was wrong. And it's quite unfortunate that now we are also having an election where most of people who vote for one candidate or another, they do it because they, do, they don't like the other side. So that's not the way to move into the future. That's not the way to fix problems in American democracy because we have to talk about positive agenda. And right now the country is divided and both sides are just you know, are, are beefing up their, their campaigns, uh, their propaganda by, uh, by the negatives of the opposite side. And unfortunately on both sides, we have so many you know, soft targets to, to uh, aim at. It's interesting when you mentioned the uh, Democratic parties need to reassess how they handled 2016. It brings to mind that CNN was criticized for putting Donald Trump on the air so much during the campaign in 2016. And when asked why they, why they did that, uh, the answer was actually a pretty simple answer. Donald Trump regularly made himself available and Hillary Clinton did not make herself available to appear. And that um, naturally seemed to give Donald Trump an advantage, as you say, to continue to, um, uh, uh, to um, espouse his thinking unchallenged throughout much of the campaign. Um, yeah, but also Donald Trump uh, uh, was a good sale. So it it's, brings numbers. So we know that. And, uh, and it's one of the reasons is that uh, the, all the, all the um, 
analysis of the social media and, and, and the mainstream media, they demonstrate that fake news and some sensationalism sells better. It's about 70% of people who rather go for, for something they never heard of, even if it's, if it's not, you know, if, if there's no solid proof behind it. And, uh, and in this atmosphere, Donald Trump is thriving. So he did it in, in 2016, and he's trying to repeat the same trick uh, in 2020, but it seems that, you know, he's running out of steam because the, this time the Democratic Party is, is more united. And I think a lot of people now, they look at Donald Trump. So the classical Trump Trump's uh, strategy of, of putting uh, his opponent uh, uh, on, the, um, on the spotlight and, 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 and uh, throwing all, all the mud there and just attacking with, with every, every tool, every resource he can find uh, handy. Uh, it's not working because as a, as a president, he is now exposed to this criticism. And uh, now it's, it's like, you know, it's like a boomerang. So what he did in 2016 now is actually coming back to home. Here. An appropriate example of that could be the first presidential debate uh, this fall. And uh, I'm curious as to your thoughts about, uh, we've now had the, the, the first presidential debate and the, and the vice presidential debate. What are your thoughts about how those went? Um, the presidential debate, I think there's no, there's no doubt. I mean, Donald Trump uh, uh, blew it up. Uh, so the way he behaved couldn't help him to win the votes in the middle that he so badly needs. And um, I think that was a very stupid move from his side because clearly Biden is not uh, uh, in, it's sort of in the best shape to have sort of the long uh, uh, segments. And uh, I would, if I were Donald Trump, I would give Biden more time to speak. So uh, expecting him to, to make a blunder. And uh, Trump actually saved Biden from any potential embarrassment by, you know, by, by interrupting him, by, uh, by coming up with, with all sorts of stupid uh, statements. And uh, you know, that's why Biden looked very, I would say, decent uh, in, and definitely, uh, definitely performed better than many expected. So uh, it was a big disaster for Trump because he was trailing uh, and, and he needed, he needed uh, to score some points. He failed. So as for vice presidential debate, I, um, it, I, 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 I read different reports and, um, and I think that uh, uh, Mike, Mike, Mike Pence did much, much better job than Donald Trump, no doubt about it, though he, he lied uh, uh, quite aggressively, so without uh, um, uh, uh, having any second thoughts about the facts, but he did it, you know, um, with grace, uh, with, good, with good presence, so I would say he looked more presidential than Donald Trump. Um, and, uh, and he wanted to expose Kamala Harris as, as a radical, uh, and dangerous radical, and potentially the president of the United States because, because Biden's health is, is not perfect and, and his age could put a question about, about his first term. Uh, but I think she, she survived this debate. I don't share the uh, enthusiasm of, uh, of CNN or other liberal medias about her performance. Um, she definitely uh, failed to win any, any new votes, but I don't think she lost any votes. And considering her performance in, in, uh, uh, in the primaries, uh, and that that's was, was quite a success because she's, you know, she can be quite abrasive and condescending. And, uh, and it, that could have a very bad effect with, uh, with uh, um, uh, people in the middle with undecided voters. But I don't think it's, it's, it was that... Uh, that was so much on display. And uh, also uh, Mike Pence remarks, um, some of his remarks that uh, um, uh, indirectly attacked two women at stage, the moderator and, 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 and the Senator Harris, I think they could be taken, they would not be taken lightly by suburban women. So that's why I don't think that this vice presidential debate was an exception. It, VP debate never changed uh, history. So uh, the first debate I watched actually was 1988, my first trip to America. And, you know, you also remember them. Lloyd Benson killed Dan Quayle. So what? <laughs> it didn't help Michael, Michael Dukakis. At the end of the day, people still looking at presidents. And the fact is that Trump now is trying to take him out of the debates will, you know, will, um, will be far more important 
than some of the potential benefits that, that Michael Pence could squeeze out of this uh, debate with, with Senator Harris. And of course, if there was a takeaway from that 1988 vice presidential debate um, to Americans, it would have been Lloyd Benson's line, uh, yeah. I, I knew Jack Kennedy. Jack Kennedy was a friend of mine, and sir, you're no Jack Kennedy. Yeah, you're not Jack Kennedy. Yes. Uh, that was great. Actually, it's the first time when I followed American politics. I, I uh, traveled to the United States uh, in February uh, 1980, uh, 1988, and, uh, and then I just, you know, I, um, from not that moment on, I, I was following every U.S. presidential election, and I'm happy to, to discuss all the, all the debates I saw. But again, vice presidential debates, they, it's, it's a good show, but I can hardly imagine it will, it will move uh, too many people to make a difference. Though I still think that the, some of undecided voters could, you know, could find more reasons to vote for Trump because of Pence's performance. But I think those undecided voters, there are some kind of uh, disillusioned Republicans that were looking for a reason to vote for, for, uh, for Trump. And maybe Pence gave them this reason. But again, I think the overall overall uh, trend, it's it's not going to change because of these debates. Do you believe that what appears to be Mr. Trump's propaganda campaign against the U.S. Postal Service to say that uh, we are not going to be able to have a fair election because of mail-in balloting um, is actually having some impact? Look, it's... Uh, it's one of the outrageous statements coming from the Oval Office. Uh, is this, nobody wants to uh, to uh, um, have so many uh, uh, votes um, uh, uh, sent by 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 mail. Obviously, people would love to do it, you know, on, on November third, and they would like to have all the results counted uh, at that night, at the election night. But we are facing and just an unpredict an, an, a crisis that could, nobody could predict. It's, it's, and how can you blame people that are willing to actually avoid crowded polling stations? And uh, to blame your opponents for, for um, irregularities and actually for, for fraud, look, coming from Trump, it's, it's very, it's very hypo uh, hypocritical. So Donald Trump uh, accusing his opponents of, 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 of fraud, you know, I, it's again, it can easily backfire. What are your thoughts on members of the Republican Party who may disagree with President Trump's politics and his demeanor privately and yet support him publicly for the sake of their own reelections? Look, um, it's, it's a simple dilemma. Do you put your country first or your party first or your own career? And uh, those who understand that Donald Trump represents clear and present danger to U.S. democracy and to American standing in the world, um, and 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 still supporting him, um, now I um, uh, I think it's just that's that's one of the reasons America is is is, is in a, American democracy is in great danger these days because too many too many political players they just look at their own benefits or their party benefits. And they don't see uh, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, other opportunities outside of the political tribe. So what's happening now that this American politics is turned into a, a tribal fight? Because what you describe is a typical tribal behavior. Yes, I know that our leader is, is, is not the best man we could select. He's not maybe decent. Maybe he's, you know, he's a cheater. Maybe he's a fraud. Maybe he's a criminal. But he's our leader. That's a tribal mentality, and that's really bad. And uh, and I have no doubt that many Republican senators who voted uh, uh, in uh, in the impeachment trial to acquit Trump, they had no doubt that Trump uh, um, uh, um, did uh, it's what he did was an impeachable uh, impeachable uh, offense, and uh, uh, and and it was a crime that had to be punished by by voting yes for impeachment, but only one of them had courage and principles to, uh, to raise his hand saying, I am guilty. Unlike a number of other nations, the historic differences between the political parties here in the United States have been very small, and the, and the major parties have agreed on the basic principles of, 
of our nation. From your vantage point, do you actually see this changing at the, at the foundational level? Uh, yes. Now, you made a statement now that the differences were always very small. Are we talking about last 50 years or about the entire American history? Because I don't think we, if we go back to the, the early days, you know, uh, 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 Jefferson Adams or, uh, uh, or Jackson uh, Clay or, of course, you know, Lincoln, Lincoln, Jefferson Davis, I don't think the difference was too small. I think that there were many moments where America had to make a choice, or even you know, uh, uh, McKinley, William Jennings Bryan. So this is the, there were moments, or Hoover, FDR. So there were moments where America had to make a choice, uh, uh, you know, about choosing the direction. But still, you know, if we go back to the last fifty years or sixty years, I agree with you. Yes, the um, uh, uh, they, there were disagreements about means, not about goals. I always want to refer to the first televised debate between uh, um, John F. Kennedy and, and Richard Nixon. It's just not just about the, the, the polity of the event, how polite were both addressing each other, senator, vice president, but it was very clear that the, the debate was not about American goals. It was about means, how we reach to a certain destination. And that's the, that's, that's, uh, well, um, that's a point you're, you're making now. And uh, today we, we are at the point where there is no uh, common ground. When you hear uh, 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 Democrats and Republicans speaking about the future, you can hardly find, you know, any any common interest. I mean, what kind of bipartisan should be talking about if uh, if uh, they could couldn't agree on certain fundamental principles uh, of uh, of, Amer of American democracy? And um, and it's it's all about scoring points. So the what uh, Republicans uh, 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 have been doing with Supreme Court. It's like an open invitation for Democrats to uh, to fight back if they are in power, basically to pack court with with with, with liberal justices. Um, I don't like it, but um, unfortunately, you know, after what's happened with Mary Garland and, and what's happening now with uh, with Barrett, so it's like an open invitation. Basically, it's a it's a provocation just to say, okay, we're in power, we can do whatever we want. That's bad news, and that's definitely it. Just brings America back to its to its worst moments, and I could say it's it's probably even worse than uh, the fifties of the nineteenth century because it's the then they had a terrible you know a rift with the South and 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 the rest of the country uh, in, in, because of slavery. But still, you know they they were not actually arguing about the uh, the fundamental principles. Uh, of, of U.S. Constitution and, and political life and, 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 and um, uh, three branches of power. Right now, I, I wonder if there is any, any agreement about it. And that's why Donald Trump can even talk about not recognizing the results of the elections. And do you see the possibility that if he loses and it's considered legitimate, that he would not vacate the White House? Now, it depends on the outcome of the elections. Losers, you know, uh, uh, could be, you know, it's the, the idea of losing could be, very, could be stretched. He can lose in a landslide. Then I don't think we have any problem. So if it's a convincing victory, uh, then I believe, you know, that there, there will be transit of power because uh, no Republicans, I mean, maybe some, but, but majority of them will never stand behind him with his claims that the election was stolen. But if election is as close as, let's say, 2016, with 75,000 votes in, in 79,000 votes in three battleground states, dividing, you know, uh, victory from, 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 from uh, a defeat. But I'm afraid we may, we may start, you know, uh, seeing very ugly uh, uh, um, scenes because uh, if Trump generates enough support among, among uh, his um, um, his cronies and his followers. Um, I I doubt that America will 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 be safe in this transition period. What we just you know learned about Michigan, it could be the first you know uh, first sign of what to expect if election is contested and if Trump has enough um, material evidence that it could be contested because it's too close. I'm not even talking about situation of 2000. What are you talking? Where where we had. 500 uh, or 600 votes 
in, in, in the state of Florida that decided the elections. And have you seen a time in your lifetime when it appears that the future of our democracy has seemed so fragile as it is now? Look, uh, we can go all the way back to the early days of the American Republic. Um, there, there were uh, arguments and uh, they, they were more than debates. There were some laws that were probably unconstitutional, like the sedition law in 1798, if I'm, if I'm correct, uh, um, pushed by Adams and, and, and Hamilton. Um, but yeah, I think that it was an understanding all the time that it's, it's, it's you know, it's, um, um, that the union is, is, is so important. That's why we just, you know, we, we have to preserve, of course, civil war, um, that's, you know, that was the most crucial moments uh, in, 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 in history. Uh, but, uh, you know, when you look at this, at the separation of, of, of the South from, from the Union, uh, obviously, you know, that was just, you know, it was horrible and the South was on the wrong side of history. They wanted to preserve uh, as a human uh, um, uh, uh, regime of slavery. But technically, even the South tried to stay within the constitutional framework. So uh, it's, uh, I think it's the first time when America is facing such, you know, such a great challenge because it's a political challenge because a lot of people are not sure that this democracy must be preserved. You look at the, uh, at the polls among American youth, 36% of, of American youth, they have positive view of communism. Uh, I don't know exact numbers, but I doubt that the majority of Americans believe that democracy is, is fundamental for the preservation of American Republic. Uh, when just I think a couple of days ago, Senator Mike Lee already talked about liberty and prosperity and said democracy is not that important. So uh, I, of course I tweeted the response that the moment you hear as any politician talks about, uh, about democracy being, being not as important as, as, as prosper prosperity and liberty, it's time to take to the streets. But the fact is that this debate now is it's, 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 uh, in the mainstream uh, uh, tells you that uh, um, unless America finds its way in, in the 21st century, how to adjust these democratic traditions and the, the foundation of American liberties to the challenges of, of, the, of, our, uh, of uh, uh, our time, that might, that might be the most serious crisis America ever faced. So let's talk about press freedom. You mentioned uh, the Alien and Sedition Acts under John Adams uh, in, in 1798. And here we have a president of the United States who has repeatedly called the press the enemy of the American people. That dredges up some very dark uh, sides of, of our world history when we have seen the, the, the rise of leaders. Um, uh, what what is the sense you get when this when this bit of propaganda is reinforced on a daily and hourly basis by no less than the president of the United States? Look, I think that the the the, uh, the Sedition Act of 1798 was a political tool that had been used uh, by Federalists against uh, uh, Jeffersonians, and uh, and uh, you know uh, at, at that time. American state, the federal government, didn't have the same means to actually to go after its uh, 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 after political opponents of the uh, uh, current administration. Um, uh, what Donald Trump is saying reminds me not of John Adams uh, or Alexander Hamilton actions, but more likely about Lenin and Stalin. It's uh, it's enemy of people. This is the language of, of Bolsheviks. This is the language of Nazis. And that's the that's that's twentieth century. We don't have to go as far as the eighteenth century to actually to to uh, hear the hear the resemblance in in in, in these quotes. And uh, uh, and the way Donald Trump presents his views about press and about people that express opinions opposite to to, to his views uh, tells you that if he has power, he will not hesitate to use it. I believe that that's one of the reasons he envies the world dictators. 
because he would love to make sure that the press in America is as subordinate and as uh, 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 docile as uh, press in Russia or in China. And we have a lot of journalists watching today. What would your suggestions be to our American journalist colleagues as they go forward uh, in this um, in this challenging environment? Look, uh, the journalists, they have to cover what's happening, but I think that you should understand that covering whatever is being said is not enough. You have to do some fact checking. You cannot give, you know, lie the same amount of time because it's, uh, it's, um, uh, it's a false sense of objectivity. It's, this, is, this is a different game. And Donald Trump is, is playing a war game. And, uh, and uh, trying to pretend that you are neutral in this fight, it's, uh, it's actually uh, doesn't serve American democracy and it doesn't serve American public. There's, there's so many lies flying around. This is the politicians these days, they care very little about, about fact checking. Um, I just remember just reading reports about presidential debates, say 2012, eight years ago, Obama Romney. Yes, exaggeration, absolutely. Some kind of bias, yes, but not open lies. They, 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 they were scared that if they caught with, 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 with an open lie, that could backfire. Today, it's all about just begging an impression, now, now, now. It's all about an immediate effect. And what happens in, in one hour or in even 30 minutes when this lie is exposed, who cares? This is, this is one of the lessons from Donald Trump. And unfortunately, he succeeds in, in, in uh, he, he has succeeded already in, in uh, forcing everyone to move in this direction. I want to go back to Russia. As of 2020, Russia ranked 149th out of 179 countries in the Press Freedom Index that's compiled by Reporters Without Borders. Russian members of parliament back in 2014 approved a law to block fake news online and to punish those who spread it. Defenders of press freedom in Russia claim that this law was really meant to attack reporting the truth by labeling it as fake news. What can reporters in Russia do today to defend themselves? <laughs> look, uh, if you look at the long list of journalists who have been killed in Putin's Russia, that's the, that tells you everything about the uh, state of affairs uh, uh, in, in, in my country today. Um, there's very little they can do uh, to, um, to defend themselves if they have opinions that uh, uh, contradict, not necessarily the Kremlin's point of view, but even just to criticize the local bosses. Uh, all bets are off. Uh, if you want to be a real journalist, if you want to criticize the government or the uh, local authorities, uh, you are in, 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 in imminent danger. Um, and uh, um, 99.9% .9 of all media in Russia, including social media, is under direct or indirect Kremlin control. They have, they have, there's very few windows that are still functioning because Kremlin thinks that it's probably useful to keep some, uh, uh, some doors uh, um, or uh, windows open um, not, to, not to have the system um, to, lose, to lose completely uh, its ability to communicate with, 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 uh, with the rest of the world. But uh, it's, a, it's a dictatorship. And uh, that's why I, I'm always you know, getting slightly annoyed when I hear people calling Putin president, because he's a dictator. He's in power for 20 years, and he shows no intention of leaving power. That's, for me, just in my dictionary, that means dictator. And, uh, and the way Putin handles Russian affairs, it's as dictatorial as one can imagine. And what's the state of human rights now in, in Russia? You can ask Alexei Navalny about state of human affairs. That's, you know, that's the most prominent uh, latest victim of Putin's Russia. Thanks God he survived. But that's the way Putin's Russia deals with political opponents, using whatever bullets, as in the case of Boris Nemtsov uh, or 
mentioning uh, another journalist, Anna Politkovska, or uh, chemical um, um, uh, poison, as in case of Alexei Navalny. Human rights in Russia exist on paper. It's the same as in the Soviet Union. Um, Russia pretends it plays by certain rules because Putin doesn't want to separate Russia completely from, from the rest of the world. He doesn't need a, a new official uh, Iron Curtain because uh, hundreds of billions of dollars, if not trillions of dollars, stolen by, by Putin's ruling elite in Russia is kept not in Russia, not in China, not in Iran, not in Venezuela, but around the world, in Europe, in the United States. So that's why keeping these uh, communications open, it's a very important uh, uh, element of, of Putin's uh, power, power play. That's why they pretend that they follow certain uh, uh, regulations, but it doesn't stop Putin from committing crimes both inside and outside of Russia. And by the way, you know, if Putin doesn't like some of the international treaties he signed or, or other Russian leaders before him signed, he doesn't care, as in the case of Crimea. He doesn't believe that he's limited by any obligations. And he also believes that whatever he does will not be met by a decisive response uh, uh, by the leaders of the free world. So uh, just imagine if tomorrow Putin shows up on Russian television and, and tells, OK, I, I confess, I decided to eliminate Navalny. I did it. I gave an order because he's, he, he deserved it. I don't think that he just, you know, he, you know he, what he's doing is good for our country. What will be the response of European leaders? I'm afraid not much. And, uh, and that's why Putin believes that he can do whatever he likes. Have you been in contact with Mr. Navalny? And uh, if so, how's he doing and, and what's next for him? Well, I, uh, uh, he's now with his family in, in, in Germany. He continues, you know, his fight. He pledges that he'll come back to Russia. That will be, that's his choice. That will be a very grave decision. I'm not sure that's the, the best uh, for his health, but again, it's his choice. Um, but it's very clear that, uh, uh, that even the, the limited criticism that Putin's regime allowed for Navalny and his group to um, uh, um, spread out in Russia, now it's, uh, it's, it's no longer acceptable. Uh, there, are, there are new red lines for Russian, for what's left of Russian opposition. And uh, um, the only way for Russia to, to, to change is for the, for the free world to actually recognize that most of the problems we're dealing with today, they, they, uh, um, they directly related to Vladimir Putin and his criminal regime. The moment Putin is out, you will not have problems uh, in, uh, in Syria, the same kind of problems in Syria. You will not have you know, um, a regime, Maduro regime surviving you will not have Lukashenko, the Belarusian dictator, uh, staying staying uh, in the office against the will of 80% of his country. Uh, you will not uh, uh, you will see the end of the occupation of, of, you, of Ukrainian territories. So many things will change because Vladimir Putin is, is, you know, is a mastermind be behind most of the global crisis since he sees a direct interest in, in, uh, in uh, um, spreading chaos, uh, spreading chaos, spreading doubts, uh, spreading confusion. And uh, he controls enormous amount of resources and he sits on, uh, on the second largest nuclear arsenal in the world. So he believes that he's above the law, above treaties, above any, any obligations that Russia ever uh, undertook. And that makes him the most dangerous man on the planet today. And uh, given your outspokenness on the subject, do you have concerns for your own safety? Uh, of course I do, but uh, would it help to complain about it and just to hide? So if Putin decides to go after you, that's, you know, nobody will, will protect you on this planet. So I, I do what I can. I, I don't drink tea with strangers. I just uh, don't visit certain countries. Uh, where, you know, my safety could be uh, in, in jeopardy. Though these days I don't visit any countries at all because I'm sitting in Croatia for several months and uh, probably will be here for, uh, for an indefinite period of time. But that's not Putin, it's, it's pandemics. 
Uh, but I understand that if you are going after Vladimir Putin, if you criticize him, and he decides that uh, you you gone too far, you are in trouble. And uh, and it seems that no one in the world bothers really much about Putin's uh, doing what he has been doing for for years. I've been saying it from early days of Putin's ascendance to power that Vladimir Putin was our problem, but eventually it will be everybody's problem. Because dictators, they, they, they're never limited by their own countries. They always look for expansion since they would, at certain point, they, are, they have no choice but to, to uh, create new crises, uh, to create more chaos since economy and domestic, um, domestic policies, they, they are no longer serving them well. So they need an international crisis. They need war, they need conflict. And uh, for me, there was no surprise that Putin uh, uh, decided to move outside of Russia, attacking neighboring countries uh, 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 through his hybrid wars and his propaganda machine, uh, European uh, um, democracies, and eventually decided to have, uh, um, to have his uh, say in American elections. And he did it in 2016. And I bet you that as we speak, they are working so hard to make sure that Donald Trump is reelected. If Putin and his regime can poison people with impunity, um, can any opposition really organize and, and, and challenge him at this point? What do you do? You wait him out? No, it's the, it's the, the, there's no opposition in Russia as such today because Kremlin controls political agenda. Kremlin controls all, all the layers of Russian social and political life. But it's, this regime is vulnerable because it depends on, on its ability to, to generate substantial amount of cash for, uh, for uh, Putin's cronies. Uh, it's, every dictator needs loyalty of his, of, of, uh, his army, uh, his bureaucracy. And as long as the free world sees nothing wrong in, 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 in trading with Putin, in, in, in offering him um, an opportunity to sell oil and gas and other natural resources in the free world and keep the money uh, uh, safely uh, in, in the Western banks, uh, to poison uh, financial, political, and social infrastructure of the free world, Putin will 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 pay very little attention to the words. All he talks about sanctions, they just it's it's they're they're quite empty because they the, the free world never had political will to use real sanctions that could uh, uh, force Putin and and uh, uh, his gang to uh, change or at least to alter their behavior. I noticed the chess set behind you. Um, you, um, you could have spent the rest of your life playing chess on the international stage, certainly an exciting and, and lucrative life. Uh, you gave it up. Um, what motivated you to make this change and to become such an outspoken person for, for your causes? Uh, I mean, let's separate this question. So it's it divided in two, in two uh, parts. One is, you know, I never thought I would play chess for the rest of my life, even when I was a world champion, because I knew the moment would come uh, and I, I uh, would be at the crossroad. For me, playing chess was not just playing and winning, but it's also making the difference. And I knew I would reach my, my limits of, of introducing new ideas, changing the game of chess, uh, pushing the, 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 the horizons, uh, in, 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 in our game. And uh, I, uh, I reached this point um, in 2003, 2004, and in 2005, I decided that it was time to move. Uh, but I didn't have a clear agenda, so for the moment, my future. Uh, the, the last 50 years was the, uh, was the moment of, actually, years. It was the period of reckoning and finding myself, so new, uh, in, new arrangements, new... Um, in, uh, um, uh, engagements uh, and uh, uh, politics uh, was a natural choice, though I always called it more of a human rights fight because I was not a, a real politician. I fought uh, in Russia for having elections, not for winning elections. And uh, I, uh, um, I believe it was my more uh, uh, the, the right moral choice. It was like an imperative. I uh, had to fight for my country against. Uh, KGB, 
I couldn't win this battle. I actually, I was not sure I could because it was not played by the same rules that I used to uh, play uh, the game of chess for, for decades. But it's, it was not about winning. It was about just taking a stand. I also did many other things. I established myself as a speaker on, on AI, on decision making. Um, uh, I am um, working with, with Avast Software as their cyber uh, security ambassador. Um, I'm writing books. I have social media. I'm, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a separate story that you know, we can spend you know, many hours talking about other things that I do outside, outside of politics of human rights. But uh, no matter how busy I am, you know, uh, and with, with, with this uh, business affairs, uh, I believe that uh, defending human rights globally, you mentioned I'm a chairman of Human Rights Foundation based in New York, and I followed uh, uh, my late hero, Basil Havel, as a chairman of, of, of uh, this board. Um, I still think that I have to raise my voice to talk about Russia and about crimes committed by Putin's regime, because... As I remember from my early days, that was the motto on top of my bed put by my mother, if not you, who else? And I think that's, uh, that's my personal responsibility to, to um, uh, take this stand and, uh, and uh, not to give it up. Two questions that have come in um, from a member of the press club, Danny al Farouk. Uh, one, are you concerned about Russia's ability to keep its nuclear assets safe? And number two, what message do you have for Russian human rights activists who may be afraid to speak out? I can tell uh, that Russian human rights activists are not afraid to speak out because if they're activists, they already understand the risks. And I, I have nothing but admiration for those who are taking this stand. And it's, it's, it's a desperate situation. Uh, 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 we did mention that a uh, few days ago, one of the uh, one of the Russian journalists, a very brave woman from Nizhny Novgorod, she burned herself. So uh, 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 because she couldn't just tolerate this uh, um, uh, um, the, the this repressions and this climate um, of stifling the press and freedom in Russia anymore. So um, and by the way, that's had very little reaction in Russia these days that tells you about the, the climate and the atmosphere in Putin's Russia. Um, now, regarding Russian nukes, I don't know. I mean, it's the, it's, I think that they are under control. I just, uh, uh, deep down, I hope that many of them do not work as many things in Russia. They just, you know, they, they look like a menace, but to most of them are just, you know, outdated and not functioning. Uh, but, um, in Putin's Russia, you can expect whatever. So can they sell it to someone? Yeah, why not? Again, it's, 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 it's not, it's not uh, um, the regime that cares about the future of the country. It's not the regime that even cares about Russia's you know, imperialism and about Russia extending its territory. That's why it's quite different from traditional dictatorships of Stalin or Hitler. It's a regime about benefits for its... Uh, for its uh, um, uh, 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 for the members of the gang, uh, it's all about uh, direct benefits and, and enriching themselves. So that's why I, uh, as I would, I would not bet my bottom dollar uh, on on Putin's um, uh, henchmen protecting Russian Russian uh, nukes if they decide that it could uh, it could uh, offer them certain benefits uh, direct or indirect. We're almost out of time. I'd like to close with a philosophical question, if you could share what the lessons learned have been from, from all the effort that went into your chess career and your phenomenal success, what did you learn? How do you use them today? Uh, I don't think I can apply directly my chess knowledge uh, to the game of politics or human rights because in chess we had rules. Uh, the rules uh, in today's politics, geopolitics, domestic politics, they they are not as rigid as uh, as as in chess or in any, any other game. But uh, it's um, uh, I think it's important for us to look at the big picture. That's the way I play chess. Uh, I think one of the problems we are dealing with today is our unwillingness to actually see that everything is connected. So we try to look for. Uh, for um, 
decisions uh, um, in, in, on, 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 on separate issues. We want to micromanage them. While we should look at political, social, financial, uh, geopolitical, uh, uh, business issues uh, as, as, as a whole, uh, there's, no, there's no solution that is, is only part uh, of, of a global solution. And I think um, that's that's what I learned from chess. That's the way I play chess. And I think that's this this global vision is required today. And of course, it's 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 always you know uh, it's always um, uh, it's like conventional wisdom to say that if you are attacking, so you are exposed, you are at risk. But I think now it's it's not taking risk, not having courage to make a decision. It's even riskier. Uh, because we reached a point where um, combining uh, global political crisis and, 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 and health crisis, we, we have to come up with a vision. And uh, I think that only America can play this role. And without America restoring its leadership and, uh, and uh, without America offering the vision for the 21st century, we'll all be in trouble. And that will be our last word today. Gary Kasparov, thank you so very much for joining us. We are pleased to present you with our National Press Club coffee mug. We will get this to you perhaps when you return to New York uh, early in the new year. And we also would like to offer you the opportunity to please join us again in person uh, in the very near Absolutely. future. Thank you. Um, thank you. Please be safe. Um, our thanks to our producer, Lindsay Underwood, to our headliners, team co-leaders Donna Linewan Leger and Lori Russo, our headliners team member Danny Selnick who organized today's event, and to our wonderful National Press Club team behind the scenes here in the Broadcast Operations Center. We thank all of our members and our guests for your questions and for joining us today. Be well, stay safe, and have a good day.